In a world where money is everything and life means nothing, a drug gang stalks the streets of Chicago. They are heavily armed, well-funded, and have dangerous international contacts. It will take every weapon in the FBI's arsenal to stop a deadly threat known as the El Rukins. In the 1980s, the drug trade ravaged Chicago's inner city neighborhoods. Heroin and cocaine sales soared. Violent crime threatened to destroy the community. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As drug profits grew, gangs ruled the streets. One of the most dangerous was called El Rukin. Agents teamed up with state and local police to bring them down, but in the process, uncovered a bizarre and frightening terrorist plot. Chicago, Illinois. In the early 1980s, it is one of the deadliest major cities in America. Powerful drug gangs have transformed the South Side from a neighborhood into a war zone. To combat the rising tide of violence, the FBI forms the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force. In Chicago, their prime target is a vicious gang known as the El Rukins. John Podliska is an assistant U.S. attorney in Chicago. The business of the El Rukins was to traffic in narcotics, cocaine and, and heroin and a control of a vast area on the south side of Chicago for purposes of selling and distributing those narcotics. They would exact tribute from other people who would uh, want to sell in that area. And they had a reputation and a well-deserved reputation for being one of, if not the most successful and the most violent uh, criminal drug dealing organizations in the Chicago area. In the spring of 1985, Several members split from the gang. They try to move in on El Rugen territory. Revenge is swift and deadly. Chicago's south side is gripped by a vicious turf war. As the murder rate climbs, the FBI seems powerless to stop the violence. Then, in May, an informant gives agents a tip. Several members of the El Rukin gang have left Chicago. They are hiding out in a house in Cleveland. Many of them are wanted for murder. FBI agents and Cleveland police raid the house and arrest several suspects. One of them is a man named Anthony Sumner. Sumner is a former El Rukin general, which makes him potentially useful. If investigators can turn him, they can get intelligence on the secret of El Rukins. Detectives question Sumner for hours. He implicates himself in a double homicide in Chicago and is facing serious time. Authorities offer to reduce charges, but only if Sumner tells them everything he knows about the El Rukins. Finally, the former El Rukin general agrees to cooperate. As Sumner talks to authorities, a terrifying picture emerges. The El Rukin gang has hundreds of members. 
They're heavily armed, they're well organized, and they're growing. The entire organization is run by Jeff Fort, a kingpin known for his efficiency and his brutality. He was at the top controlling the entire organization. Directly below him were 21 generals, and he preserved his power that way. If anyone tried to seize power from him, from amongst those 21 generals, there were 20 other people who would be in a position to let him know that, and he could retaliate. Authorities thought they had taken Ford out of commission. In 1983, he was convicted of cocaine trafficking and sentenced to 13 years in a Texas prison. According to Sumner, Jeff Fort continues to run the El Rukins. He uses the prison pay phones to contact his gang in Chicago. Sumner's statement is a major break in the El Rukin case. According to Assistant U.S. Attorney Patrick Deedy, he was the first person to actually confirm what uh, the authorities had thought for a long time, which was that Jeff Ford, who was currently in penitentiary in Texas, was regularly talking on the telephone to members of the El Rukins in Chicago and coordinating or directing activities of the organization. The El Rukins run their operation out of a converted movie theater on the south side of Chicago. It had been fortified by the El Rukins and was essentially a, a, a fortified fortress. He had people at the headquarters of the El Rukins who were required to sit by that phone 24 hours a day. There was always someone at the phone so that when he called, he could give his instructions, directions, and orders as to what he wanted done with his organization. For the task force, Jeff Fort's telephone conversations are an opportunity to learn more about the organization. Yes, Imam. No one questioned what he said and what he wanted done. There was absolutely no uh, debate, discussion, objection to anything that he was saying. And so the FBI over the summer 1985 began to develop evidence uh, to provide a sufficient probable cause to go and to begin to listen to the, these conversations. Agents activate a 24-hour wiretap to record the Kingpin's phone calls. Tom Corum is a former special agent with the FBI. In 1985, he is assigned to the Drug Task Force and the El Rukin case. The technicians installed the wiretap equipment through the telephone company. Nothing was actually installed at the prison. We did all of our monitoring, in fact, in Austin, Texas, which was 40 to 50 miles away from Bastrop, Texas, where the prison was located. We were really stunned uh, when we started hearing the conversation from Fort because he, he was speaking with, with key gang leaders in Chicago, and what we were hearing was just strings of words. Jeff Fort and his gang are talking in code and the kinds of, of series of words that we would hear said would be things like, uh, in the science of taku, love, truth, perfect man. Uh, and we had, we, didn't, we had no idea what, uh, what these words meant. And uh, we couldn't establish any form of reference to figure out what he was saying during these conversations. Agents right. believe that Fort and the El Rukins are discussing drug deals. Okay. But until they crack the gang's code, they can't prove a thing. One of the Chicago police officers came up with really a, a very good idea. The Chicago Police Department had uniformed officers almost on a daily basis make some sort of contact with the El Rukin gang members just to let them know that the Chicago Police Department was in the neighborhood and that they were being watched. And so the Chicago detective came up with the idea of having one of the uniformed officers go up to the gang headquarters, speak to one of the gang leaders while Jeff Fort was on the telephone and see if 
the gang members would encode what the police officer had said to the gang member and then feed it back to Jeff Fort in the coded form. And what we heard was the gang member come back up to the telephone where Jeff Fort was on the phone at the time and then encode that statement that had been made to him by the police officer. So at that point, we, we, learned, we learned the code words for one, the word for pound, and the word for marijuana. And the word for marijuana we found out uh, at that time was perfect man. Breaking the El Rukan code is slow, painstaking work. After two months, agents only know a fraction of the gang's business. We realized that we were missing a lot of the calls that were being made from other phones at uh, the El Rukan headquarters in Chicago. So we knew that the operation that we were running in Texas uh, needed to be concluded and we needed to set operations back up in Chicago and begin monitoring all of the phones inside the gang headquarters in order to, to get the whole story. In December, Agent Corum and his team decide to move the wiretap operation to Chicago. They establish a new listening post near El Rukan headquarters. As authorities activate the new wiretap, they encounter a familiar problem. When we turned the wire on in Chicago, I found that once again I was hearing words that I didn't understand. The El Rukan gang is using a new code. They may have found out the FBI was listening. Once again, Agent Corum can't understand what they're saying. It was like we had to start all over again when I thought we would be able to start to uh, pick up where we left off when we shut the operation down in Texas. Hour after hour, Corum listens to the recordings. He slowly pieces together phrases. Something is different. Something has changed. Some of the words I started picking up were words like up, up, uh, I started hearing words that related to travel, and there hadn't been any words that related to travel during the during the, the Texas operation. I started hearing references to New York, and I eventually heard a reference to Libya that really caused me to be really, really concerned about what changes had occurred during the three or four months that we had not been monitoring the telephones. It's a chilling discovery. Libya, a rogue nation in North Africa, is suspected of state-sponsored terrorism. A well-armed drug gang combined with foreign terrorists could pose a deadly threat to national security. In Chicago, an FBI wiretap reveals that Jeff Fort continues to run the El Rukin gang from prison. Bring it all back to me. Although the gang talks in code, authorities learn they are discussing Libya, a country suspected of terrorism. Investigators of the Chicago Drug Task Force spend hours listening to the recorded conversations. To Special Agent Tom Corum, it doesn't make sense. Why is a Chicago drug gang talking about Libya? I went back to the beginning and started listening to the conversations again, and I started piecing the bits and pieces of the conversation together and came to the conclusion that, uh, that they were talking about having met with someone in Libya who was going to provide them with money for destroying an airplane uh, here in the United States. Corum alerts the U.S. Attorney's Office. The drug investigation has uncovered a potential terrorist plot. The FBI calls in the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Special Agent Ned Hamara is assigned to the Terrorism Task Force in Chicago. We took it seriously because uh, we had no idea whether it was real or not. It was decided that the Terrorism Task Force take over the, the wire and continue an investigation to determine uh, what, if anything, was going on. Do we have three 
the drug task force offered their agents to help with uh, overhearing the wire talk uh, and uh, recorded conversations. If authorities hope to unravel El Rukin's plans, they need to decipher the new code quickly and completely. This is a conversation. At that time, we took our surveillance teams and put them to work. Fred Wheat is a lieutenant with the Chicago Police Department. His specialty is surveillance. In 1985, Wheat is assigned to the FBI's terrorism task force. We were brought in because they knew that they would need surveillance and also that uh, a number of the Chicago police officers had worked El Rukens before and would be helpful in, in, in setting up the strategy to work this organization. The surveillance team's job is to make physical observations that can be compared to the information agents are hearing on the wiretap. We basically had round-the-clock surveillance uh, on different members of the group who were involved with the conversations with Jeff Fort. We were watching those members and just trying to follow their activities. On one instance, one of the gang members reads a newspaper article to Jeff Fort and substitute the code word for the actual newsprint. So, I mean, we had a verbatim interpretation of some of those code words because he describes uh, an incident on the south side of Chicago where uh, there was a shooting involving a landlord and a neighbor of some sort. And so we were able to take those code words and go back to previous conversations, insert them into conversations, which solved a lot of our deciphering of some coded conversations. Okay, and that's it. Slowly. Agents crack the new code. Ron Reddy is a special agent with the FBI's Chicago field office. The calls that are being intercepted at the El Rukin uh, headquarters basically concern two areas. They concern the El Rukin's normal business of uh, engaging in drug transactions as well as well, what we are beginning to realize is a uh, plot between the El Rukans and the government of Libya. How'd it go? Knowing the violent history of this particular organization, we were afraid that the El Rukans were going to commit an act of terrorism in the United States in order to obtain money from the Libyan government. From the wiretap, authorities learned that several members of the El Rukan gang recently traveled to Libya. As agents continue to monitor the gang's conversations, the situation with Libya deteriorates. On April 2nd, 1986, a bomb detonates aboard TWA Flight 840 between Rome and Athens. Four Americans are killed. Nine are injured. The FBI suspects the government of Libya and President Muammar Gaddafi are responsible for the carnage. On April 4th of 1986, there was a series of conversations between Jeff Fort and a yes. general in the El Rukin organization known as yes. Melvin Mays. And they discussed this explosion on this flight between Rome and Greece. And Mays, at one point in the conversation, indicates that their group would be able to do something like that within 30 to 50 days. Yeah. It is a terrifying prospect. I want you to take a video. Via the decoded wiretap, the task force listens in on Fort's plans. The gang leader wants two of his generals, Leon McAnderson and Rico Cranshaw, to make another trip to Libya. Fort was really concerned about how are we going to convince the Libyans, you know, that we're an organization that can do something for them. One of the things that we were able to determine. He talked about getting uh, newspaper clippings to take back over there to show uh, the Libyans that uh, this is what we've been doing, this is what we can do. It's, you know, violent things that happen in, that the Arukans are responsible for. The whole idea was to convince the Libyans that the Arukans were an organization 
uh, big enough to uh, commit some significant terrorist activity or acts in the United States on their behalf. We believed it was a real threat. If McCanderson and Cranshaw return to Libya, federal agents will not be far behind. In Chicago, FBI agents and police wiretap the El Rukin gang. Two of Jeff Fort's generals are planning a trip overseas to convince Libyan officials that El Rukin can perform terrorist acts within the United States. Travel restrictions to Libya make the trip impossible. Ron Reddy is a special agent with the FBI assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. The United States had just engaged in at least two military actions against the Libyans, and the El Rukans knew that the Libyans were under scrutiny from the United States government. The El Rukans, as well as the Libyans, felt that the safest place for them to meet would be in Panama, which they called the straw hat. That was their particular code word for Panama. Cranshaw and McAnderson, two high-ranking El Rukan generals, will make the trip to Panama City. The task force needs surveillance on both men from the moment they leave Chicago until they return. On May 3rd, Cranshaw and McAnderson leave El Rukan headquarters. A surveillance team is not far behind. The El Rukans board a jet in Chicago, bound for Miami. From there, they fly to Panama. In Panama, Cranshaw and McAnderson are seen entering the Libyan embassy, presumably to meet with government officials. And on May 10th, the two El Rukans returned to the United States. We knew when they were coming back, and we worked with our colleagues at U.S. Customs and asked them to do a, a search of these individuals as the, when they arrived in Miami. They found a document in Rico Crenshaw's luggage, which they photographed. Uh, uh, Crenshaw and McAnderson were not uh, aware that this was happening, um, but the document was in Crenshaw's handwriting. Basically, they had written a letter that said that they had five-man cells in cities throughout the United States and that they were interested in trying to destabilize the government. The next day, on May 11th, the task force intercepts several telephone conversations between the two El Rukans and their leader, Jeff Fort. Cranshaw and McAnderson tell Fort the Libyans have agreed to provide financing they will deposit the money in a Panamanian bank in the United States. An attorney they met in Panama will contact them shortly. For the task force, it's a terrifying development. But agents don't have enough evidence to prosecute the El Rukan gang on conspiracy charges. In order for the FBI to establish that a crime has been committed, we must collect enough evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the conspiracy had actually taken place and that there was an intended goal of the conspiracy. And we had to prove that there was a serious plan to commit an act of terrorism here in the United States. Agents continue to listen to the wiretap, hoping to learn more. During June, Fort talks about sending El Rukans over to Libya to learn bomb-making skills. Uh, he said, we can send some of the soldiers or members over there. They could learn how to make bombs. Those individuals can come back to the United States and teach other members how to make bombs. As alarming as this scenario is, it's still not enough to prove a conspiracy.
weeks go by. The money from the Libyans never shows up. Fort panics. He will do anything to make the deal. In late June, early July, Fort became, uh, well, he just saw that the money was not going to be coming from the Libyans and that he had to do something or the Arukans had to do something to show the Libyans, you know, that they were somebody to respect. He talked about damaging a government building. He talked about planting bombs. He talked about uh, blowing up an airplane. And he talked about getting a rocket, that one that you can use once and throw away. So we figured, okay, how can we address this issue? Fort wants to buy military-grade weapons. The task force decides to use it to their advantage by becoming El Rukin's sole supplier. So enter Special Agent Willie Hulon. Willie was on the drug task force. He had already made one drug buy with Alan Knox through an FBI cooperating source. Alan Knox is a high-ranking El Rukin. Agents assume he is aware of Fort's plans. So we figured that we'd set up another drug buy with Alan Knox, and at which point Special Agent Hulon could introduce the idea that uh, he had a weapons contact and so on, and that they could, might be able to supply the Arukans or somebody else with weapons or, or any military equipment. He mentions that he has a friend who works at a military base, a friend who can steal weapons. Knox is interested. Willie Hulon is an amazing individual. Uh, he's cool, calm, collected, uh, works well under pressure. He was ideal for this situation. Uh, his, his knowledge of the street gangs, his, his calmness and operating sources, and Willie was perfect for this role. Knox tells Hulon about the kind of weapons the gang wants to buy. They were interested in grenade launchers, and so when he described the grenade launchers, he said it's the type that Clint Eastwood used in the movie, which obviously is a law rocket. The M72 law rocket is the U.S. Army's primary light anti-tank weapon. The shoulder-launched missile can penetrate a foot of armor at a range of over 200 meters. It can destroy a tank, a building, or even a low-flying airliner. Agents cannot allow El Rukin to obtain such a deadly weapon on the open market. But the development does offer unique opportunities. We decided that why not we supply or the FBI supply uh, the El Rukins with a rocket. Special Agent Willie Hulon negotiates with Alan Knox on the price. He tells Knox he can get law rockets for $1,850 a piece. Obviously, uh, we weren't going to sell these guys a law rocket that they could use or would even work. But that being said, we wanted to sell them a, a device that looked like a real law rocket and on a cursory inspection would appear to them to be a real law rocket. And they will buy for that 2200. The ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, constructs a dummy law rocket. Although it looks like the real thing, it does not contain an explosive charge. The ATF also installs a radio transmitter so agents can track the device from a distance. The inert rocket is ready. The trap is set. On July 29th, the task force launches the operation. On July 29, 1986, 
the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force launches a complex sting operation. Agents will attempt to sell a dummy law rocket to the El Rukans, a gang of vicious drug dealers who are willing to sell out their own country to Libyan terrorists. Gang leader Jeff Fort takes the bait. He tells Alan Knox to set up the buy. And we're hearing this on the wiretap after the meeting, you know, so we know that it's going to go forward. The arrangements which were basically given to us by the Orukans was we were going to meet them where the transaction was going to occur. The task force meets to plan the sting operation. The sale of the law rocket will go down at a hotel in Lansing, Illinois, 30 miles from Chicago. Normally, we would have never conducted uh, an undercover investigation like this because of the extreme danger to uh, Agent Hulon. But the fact that we knew that the El Rukans were dealing with the Libyans, we had to weigh those risks and ultimately decided that we could do it safely, that we could make the transaction safely and protect the life of our undercover agent. Surveillance teams will form the outer perimeter, four blocks from the hotel. SWAT and undercover teams will form an inner perimeter, stationed in and around the hotel. On July 31st, agents from the FBI, the ATF, the DEA, and the Chicago Police Department deploy to the hotel in Lansing, Illinois. They cannot fail. The lives of hundreds and possibly thousands of people are at stake. On the night of the Law Rocket deal, we probably had in excess of 50 individuals spread out through, through different areas. Surveillance teams assigned to the outer perimeter get into position. At 6.30 p.m., a car enters the perimeter. There are two men inside. Agents are unable to identify either one of them. Detective Wheat's surveillance team picks up the incoming vehicle. He follows it to a gas station nearby. At the gas station, Wheat is able to make a positive ID. Melvin Mays is the driver. Alan Knox is in the passenger seat. Moments after Melvin had departed the gas station, we saw him go in toward the inner perimeter. We passed on the plate number of the vehicle, the color of the vehicle, the make of the vehicle, all pertinent information that would help us keep this, this vehicle under surveillance. At the hotel, task force members get into position. We had a, a complement of SWAT, other surveillance people, other uh, case agents uh, in uh, adjacent rooms, down hallways, uh, different floors. Everything to control that situation. We didn't want people from another floor coming up. We didn't want to have citizens who weren't a part of this deal uh, getting caught in the crossfire if that happened. The other teams were prepared to move in to help secure this area in the event that things went wrong so that it was plenty of uh, firepower there on hand to deal with any situation that might develop. Mays and Knox arrive at the hotel within minutes. The sale is about to go down. The task force is ready. They know the El Rukans are willing to do whatever it takes to fulfill Jeff Ford's orders and make the buy. On the night of July 31st, 1986, two members of the El Rukan gang arrive at a hotel in Lansing, Illinois. They have arranged to purchase a light anti-tank rocket. 
Their goal, to prove to the Libyan government that the El Rukans can operate as terrorists for hire. They have no idea that the man they are dealing with is an undercover FBI agent. Members of the Joint Terrorism Task Force can hear every word of the transaction. Detective Fred Wheat and his surveillance team is stationed four blocks from the hotel. We heard a knock on the door. We could actually hear the physical knock. We heard some voices and someone asked who it was, et cetera. He was admitted into the room. We could hear them negotiate or talk about the sale of the rocket. The launch. A little something extra I threw in. Can't see the rocket launcher. Where is that? It's on the photo. You know I don't do business like that. Where's the cash? It's close. You get your launcher when I get my cash. A few minutes later, Melvin Mays leaves the hotel. He needs to get final confirmation from gang leader Jeff Fort before the sale can be completed. Mays returns to El Rukin headquarters to wait for Fort's call. Jeff Fort controlled every aspect of the El Rukin organization to include this transaction. The wiretap picks up the phone call between Mays and Jeff Fort. Fort seems leery about the buy. He's worried that it's a setup. Fort instructs Mays to bring a young gang member back with him. They should arrive at the hotel in separate cars. If the buy is a setup, Jeff Fort would rather sacrifice a low-level gang member than risk one of his generals. In other words, Fort did not want any contact or any trading of money between the undercover agents who he suspected and his generals. Fort orders him to deliver the money to the hotel and then pick up the law rocket. sale goes off without a hitch. have no idea that the law rocket is a dummy. The low-level El Rukin takes off in the direction of Chicago. Surveillance units follow him onto the Dan Ryan Expressway. At that point, we had surveillance behind them, in front of them, on the side of them, down the expressway, coming on at certain exits, getting off at certain exits. Suddenly, the young gang member transporting the law rocket pulls over and stops.
Seconds later, another vehicle pulls alongside him. It's Melvin Mays. What are you doing? Stop. As it turns Stop. out, the gang member's Stop. car has broken Stop. down. The law rocket is transferred to May's car. We would not have known that it changed from one vehicle to the other or one person to the other unless we had a physical eye on that uh, transaction. The law rocket had been equipped with a radio transmitter and we were using electronic equipment and physical surveillance to follow the rocket back to where they eventually stored it. Mays drives to an apartment building on South Kenwood Avenue, a few miles from El Rukin headquarters. The gang members refer to this building as the armory. Then our job really began because at that point we were 24-7 on that location because we had to make sure that that law rocket was not moved. Special Agent Ned Hamara continues to monitor the wiretap. A couple days went by, Fort's uh, fears were allayed that they weren't police, and in subsequent conversations, he says, okay, let's buy five more. You know, we want five more, and we're gonna test one. Task force members are worried. Fort has chosen a target to prove his terrorist capabilities. He intends to kill a Chicago police detective. The detective who was kind of, he, he worked for the gang crimes, Chicago Police Department, who was kind of a thorn for many years in the Orukan side. They hated him and they figured, okay, we're gonna buy some rockets, but we're gonna use one and we're gonna test it on him. Gentlemen, according to the wiretap. The attorneys and the agents all made the decision, okay, let's take it down now. Let's not wait any further, because we figured if they tried to test the law rocket, they're going to determine that it's a dummy rocket and it's going to blow a lot of people's cover. The FBI makes a dangerous call. It's time to take down the El Rukin gang and put Jeff Fort behind bars forever. The FBI has the El Rukin gang on the hook they have surveillance photos and wiretaps of the gang purchasing a dummy law rocket. From his prison in Texas, gang leader Jeff Fort instructs the El Rukans to buy five more rockets. He wants to test fire one of them to prove that his gang can perform terrorist hits for hire. We had to prevent the Arukans from actually doing something to try to impress the Libyans. Uh, we felt it prudent at that time that we'd gone along far enough, we had enough evidence to at least put them behind bars for at least weapon charges, if not uh, the terrorist activities. We weren't going to take the chances that they were going to get a law rocket from an outside source and use it. A live law rocket in the hands of a violent gang like the El Rukans would be catastrophic. I think everybody decided it was time to uh, take it down. On the morning of August 5th, the task force launches simultaneous raids on El Rukan headquarters and on the apartment building they call the Armory. That building at 39th and Drexel was a fortified fort. It had steel doors on both the front and rear and iron gates across the other doors. We had to use a, a burning bar that day to gain entry into the fort to execute our search warrant. Go, 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 go. We went from surveillance officers to search and uh, control officers. We began systematically arresting across the uh, city all individuals that were involved in this plot. 
in an office at El Rukin headquarters. Authorities find travel itineraries to Libya for Rico Cranshaw and Leon McCanderson. The second arrest team raids the apartment building on South Kenwood Avenue. I was at the location on South Kenwood. Our main objective was to find the law rocket. We're walking all through the complex, you know, behind the, the ATF agent who's got the beacon and he's going upstairs and downstairs and all around, oh, it's getting fainter, we're getting stronger. We were in there for, you know, it seemed like a half hour and we're walking and we're still can't, not getting it. And finally, we go down into the basement. And this is a rat infested, roach infested location. But when we're going down the stairs, it gets louder and louder and louder. Finally, we decided it's got to be under the stairwell. So we ripped open the stairwell, and sure enough, the law rocket was there, along with about 35 other uh, assortment of automatic uh, weapons that we discovered. Some of them were submachine guns. Uh, who knows you know, how many weapons were used in crimes or murders or what. The main thing, we got the law rocket back before they were able to determine what, that it you know, was an inert or dummy law rocket. McAnderson and Cranshaw are arrested without incident. Alan Knox is also taken into custody. Melvin Mays is nowhere to be found. On October 30th, 1986, Jeff Fort, Alan Knox, Rico Cranshaw, and Leon McAnderson are indicted on charges of conspiracy, possession of weapons, and use of interstate facilities to carry on unlawful activities. Melvin Mays, who is still a fugitive, is placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. In 1987, McAnderson and Cranshaw are convicted and sentenced to more than 50 years in prison. Melvin Mays eludes authorities for nearly nine years. In 1995, he is arrested and convicted and sentenced to three life terms in prison. Jeff Fort, who is already incarcerated, is sentenced to spend an additional 80 years in prison. This was the first instance in the United States history that American citizens had been convicted for attempting to commit a terrorist act for a foreign government. For Chicago police, the El Rukin case is a major victory. A dangerous street gang has been destroyed. For the FBI, the El Rukin case is a battle won in the ongoing war against terrorism.